Welcome back to episode 6 of the It's Coming podcast. The Huskies hit the road for the first time this season and it was a whirlwind. James Booknight suffers what looks like a day-to-day elbow injury, but in the end, the Huskies are coming home to Connecticut with a sweep of their opponents and an AP Top 25 ranking for the first time since 2016. That's right, what a road trip it was. But first things first, we'd be remiss not to pay tribute to the legendary D. Rowe, an icon at the University of Connecticut who passed away on Sunday at the age of 91. But back to UConn men's basketball. 3-0, like you said, on the road trip. That means my hot take from last episode was right. Booyah! The Huskies swept the road trip just like I said they would. It wasn't pretty, it wasn't easy, but... They are a top 25 team. They're 7-1, and one, and they got a week to prep before St. John's. Let's get right into it. It's episode 6 of the It's Coming podcast. Kemba Walker, step back. Walker, Cardi and Kemba! And the Huskies are the top dog in 2011. L.I. Main comes over and says we shot the world. Bounce up ahead to put them to the end. You know, people better get us now. That's all. You better get us now, because it, it's coming. All right, Noam, and for the first time in what feels like forever, we are breaking down more than one game in a week. So let's not waste any time. We're going to jump right into this Marquette discussion. With Book Night Hurt, the second half was looking like it was going to be a worse disaster than the first half somehow. Marquette opened the half by scoring the first 10 points pushing their lead to 18, but in that next timeout, Dan Hurley challenged his team. And, uh, you know, it was like a boxer going to the stool after just getting rocked. And, uh, you know, we had to decide, uh, you know, if we wanted to get off the stool and continue to fight. And, uh, you know, it just showed a, a, lot of, a lot of character. And then from there on out, I mean, it was the Tyler Polly show. We all know the story. 23 points in the second half matches how many points Marquette scored in the half from their entire team. 8 for 12 from 3. He was unconscious, man. He even went to the rim and put together some good old-fashioned three-point plays with the N1. And here's what Polly had to say about his performance. It kind of felt like that. Like, if I touch the ball and I shoot it, it's going in. That's what it felt like tonight. Every time I touch the ball in the second half, I'm like, it's going in when I shoot it. It's really nice to see him also just taking it to the rim and being able to do other things and just shoot threes. We talked about that a lot. Uh, that he needs to be able to find other ways and score other than catch and shoot, drive to the rim. And uh, even on the three-point line, when he was really feeling it, I mean, he was taking he was taking jump shots right in your face, contested shots. I was very impressed. Huge credit also to the wrench, Isaiah Whaley. Uh, this was obviously the Tyler Pauly game, but without Isaiah Whaley, UConn just, they wouldn't be so together on the defensive end. And now Marquette shot just 38.6%. That's going to win you a lot of ball games. Like I said, if you hold teams under 40%, you're going to win. But Whaley was the only other player besides Tyler Pauly to score in double digits, and he also picked up yet another double-double. He was also a guy who just showed he wasn't going to quit on this team, on this game, even when they went down 18 points, and he really got the team going. There were timely blocks, timely steals, and he's just always one of those players who's never afraid to hit the deck. Such an energy guy. Isaiah Whaley, huge credit to you. But obviously, Matt, like you said, Tyler Pauly, man, that dude was hot. I couldn't believe it. It was the performance we had been waiting for from him for quite some time. And then we go into the Butler game, and he does it again, leading the team in scoring in that game as well. That's right. It was another good game for Tyler Pauly. That was UConn's first game without James Booknight for the entire game. It was announced a couple hours before the game that he would be out. So how did UConn win? They won with defense, they won with rebounding, and they won with balanced scoring. We'll start with the defense. They held Butler to 47% shooting. Not too bad for Butler, but they forced 15 turnovers. Next, UConn won the rebounding battle. The stats don't necessarily tell the full story. They won the rebounding battle 30-27, to but they really controlled the boards the entire game. And then the last thing, balanced scoring. Without an alpha like James Booknight, you know, a guy who's going to put up 20 points a game, UConn needs multiple scorers. what they get? They got five guys that scored at least seven points. Next up, it was the return of a cook a cook. His first play back was a two-handed slam. He showed off those newly juicy biceps. It was great to see a cook back. We didn't necessarily see a lot of him. I think he only played about eight minutes or so. But, you know, UConn fans love a cook. 
as he gets more and more in shape, he's going to be a X factor for this team. Then late in the game, Matt, I know you'll talk about this later, but Whaley had two massive blocks. The first one was on Bryce Golden and the second one was on Aaron Thompson. It looked like he was playing against middle schoolers. He just literally swatted the crap out of them. And then lastly, Tyler Pauly, he was still hot. Five of eight from three, so he was 10 of 16 combined Marquette and Butler. But then he made adjustments as the game went on. As Butler started to close out on his threes, he started taking it to the hoop. You know, tough finishes or get fouled and go to the free throw line. And that's a big step for Tyler Pauly because if teams are going to guard him tighter on the three-point line, he'll make him pay inside. Yeah, and like you said, this was a big, big game for this team. I mean, no no James Booknight. Um, and, you know, kind of shows that this team can get it done without him. Butler is, I mean, every team in the Big East is going to be a tough game no matter what. Butler is a good defensive team. Uh, so being able to share the basketball and share the scoring was uh, really impressive. Moving on to the DePaul game, uh, this one was a little bit of a struggle for the Huskies. Uh, maybe some people didn't see it coming, but uh, Tyrese Martin in the first half had a less than stellar half, but he stepped it up big time down the stretch when the team needed someone to take control. That's what these upperclassmen need to do. It seems like these games that we're getting these these big wins, it's always one of it's Tyrese or or Tyler or Isaiah, you know, and this is this is exactly what good teams do. Someone steps up. He finishes the game with 18 points and five steals. The defense again was key, forced DePaul to turn the ball over a lot. I mean, there were so many plays where DePaul was bringing it down the court on like a fast break, and they just throw it into the middle, and UConn swallows it up. Here's what Dan Hurley had to say about the de- about the defense down the stretch. Yeah, that's what winning teams do. You know, good teams in the last four or five minutes of a close game, they uh, they rely on their defense. The turnovers were brutal for DePaul. I mean, it's not a very good team. I kind of came into the game thinking. UConn was probably going to win by 15 or 20. Um, DePaul played tight, though. I mean, they hung right in it, but the turnovers were brutal. They had 24 turnovers in a 40-minute game. That's that's awful. And like you said, a lot of them were just sort of unforced. They just threw the ball into the middle of the paint, like right to UConn, guys. But this is another game that proves that a good team like UConn can just gut out a win and win even when they're having an off night. It was another night without James Booknight. It was a night where the offense never really clicked, but it's a night where they got a big win to go 3-0 and on the road trip. Yeah, and wrapping up that road trip, but right before we do, some news about the team. It was announced earlier in the week that Javante Brown will be entering the transfer portal. The seven-foot freshman from Canada only appeared in two games so far. It hasn't been much of a factor. However, we knew this coming in. He knew this coming in, what his role was going to be. You know, He's a freshman behind a lot of senior guys, a lot of bigger guys. And he was okay with that, but Brown said that his departure, uh, it was really part of the departure of Kenya Hunter leaving for Indiana, and it had been really tough on him. He wanted to see how the season could play out, but ultimately, I mean, the kid's got to make the best decision for himself. So best of luck to him. Hopefully he finds a good base that he can fit into. Next up, closing thoughts from the road trip. This was absolutely huge that the team won two of these games without James Booknight playing at all. And they won against Marquette when Book Knight really wasn't a factor. Um, he was clearly hurt when he was back on the floor. He didn't really impact the game at all, but UConn was able to gut it out. Now they have a week to prepare. And like Dan Hurley said, post-game against DePaul, he said, we'll know more about Book Knight's status. And that will allow UConn to maybe prepare a game plan more fully with Book Knight out of the mix. But UConn back in the national spotlight, and that came from two wins without their best player. Yeah, and it's the first time this team has won their first three road games in a season since 2008. Look, I get that these aren't true road games, okay? There's no packed, you know, there's no packed stands. It's it's limited fans or it's no fans. And yes, they're they're not playing the top teams in the conference, but this is a huge step up, okay? They've always in the past few seasons struggled on the road. So to see them string together three straight and the first three, I mean, that that's absolutely massive. Now, let's not give too much credit to DePaul. Um There were about the same number of fans there last night as there would have been during a regular season. No comment on Charlie Moore, though. Anyways, moving on to some efficiency numbers, some Ken Palm, some net, you know, all these analytics that we love to talk about, don't we? UConn now sits at 26th for points against per game and is ranked 16th for adjusted defensive efficiency. That leads them to the number 23 spot in the net rankings, which is one of the biggest components come Selection Sunday, and they're number 21 in Kempom. Now, 
you look back at their schedule, some people may say, how are they in the top 25? They don't have very many good wins. But one win that is looking better and better is the win at Mohegan Sun against Southern California. This is a team that just swept the road trip in Arizona. They beat Arizona and Arizona State. And now the Trojans are 16 in the net rankings and 16 in Kempom. So Husky fans, you got to cheer for the Trojans. You got to hope that that win just keeps getting better and better as the season goes on. Now, moving into some of our segments, MVP of the week, we would just be doing a sin to basketball if we each chose one. So Matt, I'll let you take this one. Yep, we're going to choose Tyler Powley this week. It's pretty pretty, pretty obvious if you ask me. Single-handedly saved UConn against Marquette, okay? Uh, and then on top of that, he's leading the scoring against Butler. And uh, he's making some timely shots against DePaul and Butler when the team needs it most to stop the bleeding, right? I just mentioned that someone's got to step up. And he was the guy that was able to throw up uh, a shot to stop bleeding and get the momentum back for the Huskies. Noam, uh, play of the week. I will let you go first. What do you have? So my play of the week isn't actually one specific play, but it was Tyler Pauly catching fire against Marquette. 8 of 12 overall, 5 of 8 from deep. In the words of Mike Breen, it was just bang after bang after bang. Every time he touched the ball, like he said, he felt like it was going in. I mean, I was watching at home, and there was one possession. He got the rebound. He pulled up from, you know, it would have been deep NBA range in a guy's face and just buried it. It was like your classic heat check. So Tyler Pauly gets my nod for play of the week. Yeah, and for me, just like you, it's not actually just one play, but it's two consecutive plays. And it's the Isaiah Whaley back-to-back box towards the end of the Butler game. I mean, that first one, he was amped, man. He Big, big-time uh, chest bump with uh, Brendan Adams. And then that second one, right, they take the timeout, they talk it over, shot clock's about to expire, throw it up. And Isaiah Whaley, he hit this ball like he was going for the kill in beach volleyball, okay? If this was Gamble Pavilion... And if this was normal times, he would have hit a kid in the second row of the student section, no doubt. I mean, the the absolute force that this guy hit the ball with, it had hit amped, it had me amped, my play of the week. We're going to move on to under the radar. And for me, (laughs) it's it's not actually a play this week. It's going to be some stats. For me, that's UConn this season against the spread. I believe they're 7-1 against the spread now. So the team is greatly outplaying Vegas' expectations up to this point. I couldn't be happier. Noam, what about you? My under-the-radar analysis of the week is how well Tyler Pauly can find his shooting pocket. You know, when he catches the ball, he pump fakes so effortlessly. He sidesteps so effortlessly. He gets his feet set, his shoulders squared, and it looks like he's always ready to shoot. You know, whether a defender closes out and he can't shoot or whether the defender doesn't close out and he just buries one in the guy's face, he's always ready. There was one play yesterday, he caught it, He pump faked, jab stepped, and then shot it. The defender just went flying by him. He had a wide open three. He hit it. And then going along with that is how well he moves off the ball. It reminds me of Ray Allen. Ray Allen would always come off backdoor screens, find himself in the corner wide open and bury threes. Tyler Paul is doing the same thing, and Dan Hurley is really figuring out how to get him going in offensive sets as well as in transition. Yeah, and and if you watch uh if you watch Tyler in the offensive sets, like you said, I mean, he, the guy is constantly moving around the court. He's he's not someone that tries to run to the corner once and if he's not open, well that's it for the play. He, I mean, he is out there constantly moving around trying to find himself open. And he's always got his hands up. He's always ready for the ball to get to him so he can release that shot as quick as possible. All right, moving on to the overreaction slash hot take of the week. I'm just going to dedicate this to myself and you and our friends and other people that we talked to during that Marquette game that thought that UConn was going to be down and out. Yeah, everybody thought we were down and out. We were down 18, and then all of a sudden Penfield just pulls out the tweeting machine and it's like, you know what, if UConn comes back from this from this deficit, I'm going to drink some hot sauce. Lo and behold, every person listening to this podcast, your Twitter is filled with with shit about hot sauce and it is bizarre it is weird and we love it a couple hours ago i just talked with the husky ticket project as well as penfield about sort of what they're doing to capitalize off the hot sauce craze so for every shot of hot sauce you take husky ticket project is asking you to donate to them that will send local connecticut kids to yukon athletics games when fans are allowed again that's up on our youtube at UCTV Channel 14, as well as our Twitter and Instagram at UCTV Sports. But as for my hot take of the week, 
It's that Dan Hurley should get out there and drink some hot sauce this week. There's no game until Monday. He's got nothing better to do. So, Dan, if you're listening, go get some hot sauce and drink it, man. Now, moving on to our get him next time segment. There's a lot of candidates, I think. I don't think every player necessarily played up to their full potential this week. I don't think the team necessarily did. But it was a struggle without book night. But, Matt... What do you have for your get him next time? Uh, for me, it's it's get him next time, Jalen Gaffney. I would just, you know, I think we're both hoping he would be doing a little more than he has been doing lately. He's only had one game where he scored more than six points this whole season. He's a guy that I think a lot of people pegged, and I certainly pegged, as having a bigger scoring role uh, or just a bigger role in this team. And so far, uh, it's been a little bit of a struggle for him. He has shown those flashes where he can knock down a three or he can have a really smooth finish around the rim after a nice move to beat a defender. But we just need to see that more consistently. So, you know, Dan Hurley is the man with the plan. All faith in him and his lineups. But hopefully Gaffney can have a breakthrough game soon, especially if, like you said, Book Knight is going to miss some more time. As for my get him next time, it's UConn's ball movement. The Huskies are 10th in the conference in assists. And I was talking about it last night against DePaul. They just don't really move the ball well. They pass a lot, but they're never really you know, making the defense rotate. And that's one thing that when you watch a team like the Spurs or even UConn women's basketball, they're always forcing the defense to rotate. And that way you're getting wide open shots or you're getting easy drives to the lane. So I want to see less dribble handoff action outside the three-point line. And I want to see more pick and roll action, more drive and kick. I want to see them making the defense rotate more. And I want to see those assist numbers go up. So now let's look ahead and catch up a little bit. Yeah, UConn 2022 target Corey Floyd Jr. is set to announce where he's going to play his college ball this week. It would be a big pickup for the Huskies. He has offers from Rutgers as Villanova as well. And them two with UConn are widely considered to be the final three for him. UConn was supposed to play against Villanova later this week, but that has been postponed due to COVID within Villanova's program. But the next possible game as of right now would be St. John's next Monday at 5 p.m. hosted at Gamble. St. John's has struggled largely in the Big East so far, a 1-5 record. They are going to play Butler and Marquette before coming to stores. It's really a bummer that that Villanova game got uh, postponed. Villanova's really been ravaged by COVID. It's unfortunate for them, but it's also unfortunate for the Big East as a whole because that's the conference's premier program. On last episode, I talked about UConn sweeping the road trip, getting ranked, and coming into a Friday night tilt against a ranked opponent in Villanova. Now we're going to have to wait a little longer for that. I also thought that, you know, this was the perfect amount of rest. They would get Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to practice, get a little healthy, and then play Nova. Now they'll have an extra couple days. Maybe James Booknight will be back next Monday, which is a silver lining. So hopefully we'll get an episode recapping that St. John's game and potentially touching on a new commit, if that's in the cards for Corey Floyd Jr. before the rest of the games next week. The schedule picks up for UConn in January. It'll be great to be able to talk about multiple games on each episode. But now we're going to get to our modified Hurley Juice sound of the week. Yeah, the Hurley Juice moment of the week. I'm going to break the rules here. Uh, it's going to be the Tyrese Martin Juice of the week. So here it is. Um, we just practice like maniacs every day. No one in the country practices like us. And I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly believe that no one in this country practices like us. Thanks for tuning in to episode six, everybody. If you're still listening, make sure to go donate to the Husky Ticket Project. They're doing great work for the kids of Connecticut. For Matt Gepford, I'm Noam Watt. We'll see you next time on the It's Coming podcast. Have a good one, everybody.